Um, so what we have talked about in this discussion to date is we talked about the uh, architecture of SAP, ERP, and other uh, <coughs> enterprise information systems and how it's evolved over time. We talked a little bit about the core modules in the system and, and what kind of functionality they provide, keeping in mind that we did just talk about the core modules and there are many other modules of a more minor nature that, that we haven't touched on, nor will we really touch on this semester. And we talked a little bit about SAP Business Suite and NetWeaver and how all those pieces interact with one another and how NetWeaver essentially functions as the glue which holds everything together. So today we're going to turn our attention largely to this issue of uh, the classes of data that one sees in an ERP system. And uh, we'll look at organizational data. We'll kind of draw some parallels there to some of the things you've been doing in your lab work. We'll talk about um, the material data, the material master. And I'm guessing that that's probably all we'll have time for today. But we may also start talking about the document concept as well. So without further ado, as you hopefully know at this point, because you answered some questions about this for a previous homework assignment, there are in fact three classes of data that one finds in an enterprise information <coughs> system. We want to uh, beef up our understanding of this and make sure that you truly understand the functionality of these elements with, within a system. Organizational data is that data that is within our system that represents the various business entities that compose how we have elected to structure our organization, and most importantly, how they relate to one another. So we think in terms of things like storage locations and plants and company codes and purchasing organizations and purchasing groups and other entities of that sort, those would all be things that would fall into the category of organizational data. And as this semester continues, we will dig into organizational data with great specificity. In our previous discussion, I made uh, reference to um, Legos and how Legos come in different sizes and different colors and shapes and so on. Organizational data has some things in parallel to that in that the designers of an enterprise information system define the various kinds of pieces that you have available to work with. And those pieces are the organizational data. And just like with Legos, there are certain ways that you can hook things together, and then there are certain ways that you might want to put things together, but the pieces don't work that way. Same thing is true with organizational data, we'll find. They have certain characteristics, and those characteristics enable us to do certain kinds of things with them, but not other things. And so we need to learn the various rules that govern how organizational data can be represented in our system. Master data, I've never really liked the definition of master data because it's really more of a description than a firm definition. But I think as we go along here, at least I hope, you'll start to get a feel for what is master data as compared to the other kinds of data that you work with. Master data is that data that is in the system that is regularly or that is relatively fixed and is frequently exchanged across and among business processes. <coughs> Two great examples of that, well really three great examples, are what I have enumerated here on the slides, our materials. We define materials, we identify them with a code, and then that code is used throughout a wide variety of processes always to identify the same product. And it gives us the benefit of being able to say that we know that this particular code is always associated with this material, so we have that uniform understanding. Same thing is true with our customers and our vendors. When we create a customer, when we create a vendor, we go into the system, we supply certain requisite information, and then either we assign or the system assigns automatically for us an account number. 
for our customers or for our vendors. And so at that point, it becomes well known that if we're talking about vendor 112468, that we all can look into the system and see the same vendor pop up every time. And that vendor is obviously going to be very important to us in things like procurement, but there are other contexts such as accounts payable where a vendor's information becomes very important. So by having a standardized definition of a vendor that we can share across our business processes, we pick up uniformity. The big thing that distinguishes organizational data from master data is organizational data is talking about entities that exist in our company. Things like plants, things like uh, purchasing groups and so on. Those are entities that exist in our company, whereas master data often refers to things that are external to our company, like customers and vendors, or things that we work with, but aren't uh, of the same type as organizational data. Transaction data is data that populates our system that results from executing business process steps. Now, as a point of fact, uh, when you think about transactional data, an example of transactional data would be an order from a customer. If we were to look at an order from a customer in our system, we would see that there is certain organizational data reflected on that order to indicate, for example, what plant the order will be fulfilled out of, what salesperson, or more particularly, what company code should get credit for making that sale, what sales area is responsible for the overall transaction. That would all be example of organizational data. As we observed a moment ago on this sales order, we would see reference to the customer that's actually the one making the purchase, and we would see reference to the material <coughs> that the customer is in fact ordering. So that would be master data. Situational data are things like dates and quantities and things of that sort. So for example, we might know that the Dallas plant is going to ship out red bicycles. Dallas plant is organizational data, red bicycles is master data, but in order to have this actually be a valid transaction, we need to know how many bicycles and what date should those bicycles arrive. That would be an example of situational data that describe the organizational data and master data. We put all that together, and that's transactional data. Now, let's reflect on this for a moment. Of these three kinds of data, which of these is most abundant <coughs> in an enterprise information system? Which of these would we see much more of? Transactional data. Because probably minute by minute as time goes by, new transactional data is being put into the system. Which of these would we likely see the least of? Probably organizational data. Because although we might have a large number of plants, we probably have far more products than we have plants. You know, we might have 10 plants, but we might sell a thousand different products. So the one of these that you're likely to see the least of from a data storage perspective is organizational data. We talked before about some of the challenges related to master data management. Another key element that is very important to us in our organization is managing transactional data. Because of the fact that transactional data potentially comes in with such great frequency, we are going to have to have some kind of strategy for figuring out how we're going to manage that accumulation of data over time. An organization like Walmart, on a daily basis, will accumulate a huge amount of transactional data. Well, if every day they just took in more and more information into their system and never got rid of any of it, 
well, they would have the system become over full, performance would suffer and things of that sort. So there are a lot of uh, data strategy management implications in, in working with these that we will explore over time as, as well. Just to make sure we, we have an understanding of this, this would be just an example of the <coughs> kinds of organizational data entities that we have in SAP ERP and how it might relate to terminology that we would use in our organization. We'll dig, dig into these in more detail, but the highest level of organizational entity that we have in SAP ERP is the client. We might refer to that as a conglomerate. We might call ourselves an enterprise, but whatever our organization is, at its highest level of aggregation, we refer to that by the term client. A company code, that, that sounds kind of weird. You might be thinking in terms of what we call it a company, but no, in fact, we call it a company code. A company code in SAP ERP would equate to what we might in common English call a company or a subsidiary, and we'll get into what distinguishes a company code from other kinds of organizational elements. A plant is an organizational data element in SAP ERP. We might refer to it as a factory, a warehouse, a distribution center. We could even just call it an office because as you will see, what you and I think of when we think of a plant, meaning maybe a big building with smokestacks and heavy manufacturing equipment, doesn't necessarily have to be that. In fact, a doctor's office could be a plant in SAP ERP terminology. We have a sales organization. Now sales organizations, we might think of that in terms of sales teams or other ways that we elect to organize our salespeople within our company. We call that a sales organization from an ERP organizational data element. We have divisions. In our company, we might refer to those as different product lines. We might use the term division, but that's a type of organizational data we'll talk about. And then we have things like storage locations. Now that list there on the right of those six different uh, organizational data examples, that's not exhaustive. But for sure, those are six of the most frequently used and referenced in our ERP system, and you have already seen and will continue to see those show up with great recurrence in, in your lab work. Let me give you a real world example of this. <coughs> a student sent me this graphic that he found on the web. Uh, he sent it to me a couple of years ago, and I think <coughs> at the time he sent it to me, it was already out of date because if you know anything about the way some of these big businesses operate, they're almost <clears throat> continually buying and selling different companies and reorganizing themselves. But what this graphic illustrates is, you've all heard of Coca-Cola for sure. Well, Coca-Cola is actually a very large organization that although at one time they started out just making and selling Coca-Cola, as they grew, they have bought other companies and folded that into their product line. So, in fact, this would be, if you will, the Coca-Cola clients, <coughs> and then they operate a number of different company codes. There's a Coca-Cola company, but then there's also Sprite and Fruitopia and Monster and Dasani and Mellow Yellow and I don't know how you say that, Glass So vitamin water and all of those products, they're actually all owned and operated by Coca-Cola. Um, Pepsi owns Quaker Oats, owns Yum Brands, which Yum Brands in turn owns Taco Bell and KFC and Pizza Hut and Fazoli's. There's the Pepsi products that we would most closely associate with Pepsi, but they also own a number of chip companies and snack companies. So what you're seeing illustrated here is this idea of a client 
that might in fact service multiple company codes. So it may well be that the craft organization says we are going to run SAP ERP. <coughs> so they license it. And they say we are going to run it across our entire scope of operations. So they set up an ERP system. When they set up an ERP system, one of the things that you get to pick is what three-digit number you want to use as your client number. <coughs> and so Kraft might say, we like the number 342. And so if you work at any of these companies and you launch the SAP GUI, and you get ready to log in, you're going to use client number 342. That number represents craft at its highest level of aggregation. Well then, within craft, when you're running particular transactions, if you're the Kool-Aid company, let's just say hypothetically that the company code associated with Kool-Aid is KA1. So we'll see a lot of transactions with KA1 as representing the company code. We might also see in the system <coughs> HM1. We might see um, W1 for Welch's. We might see DP1 for Dr. Pepper, and so on. Every one of these entities, which in fact is a standalone company on its own, you know, it's very likely that I, I don't know who created Oreo, but if we go back in history at one point in time, there was just the Oreo company that made Oreos. And eventually they got large enough that they were interesting to Kraft, and Kraft decided to buy them. And so now they're part of the Kraft family. So that's this distinction here between a client and a company code. Now, in your homework, we log into our ERP system using, is it client 304, mm -hmm. I think? So in essence, we are all part of the same large conglomerate. But each of you has your own distinct company code that is based on your number that is also a part of your login name. So if we were to draw a diagram of this, we would have, you know, 304 at the top, which we might call, um, I don't know what, American Bicycles. <coughs> and then underneath American Bicycles would be all of your companies reflected here as distinct company codes. Let me give you one more illustration of this, and then we'll dig into more technical details. ERP SIM, that you all uh, have some experience playing. Well, if we were to take things that you saw in ERP SIM and be more precise about it, ERP SIM featured a number of different company codes, Berlin Muesli, Hamburg Muesli, Kohl Muesli, and so on. Those were all distinct company codes, but they all existed within the same overall enterprise of German Muesli Incorporated. Now, if you think about that for a moment, if you were on the Berlin Muesli team and you looked at your company's records, you only saw your records. And if you were on Hamburg Muesli, you only saw your company's records. So even though you're part of the same larger organization, your information <laughs> is kept partitioned by the system based on the way we have chosen to organize our company. I had the ability to look at things from a client perspective. And so I could actually look at a financial statement that would show all of the company codes combined if I wanted to see what the overall revenue and overall profitability was. It wasn't particularly useful given the context of playing the game, but that was something that was possible. Every one of your company codes had its own distinct plant that you made your muesli in. And you realize, of course, from playing the game that Berlin Muesli 
controlled the Berlin plant and told it what to do, and Hamburg Muesli controlled the Hamburg plant, and it wasn't like Berlin Muesli could get another plant to make stuff for them. There was this ownership and control relationship that came to us based on the specification of our organizational data. This was transparent to you, but every one of your companies also had a sales team that was out there trying to get people to buy your Muesli. And so the Berlin Company Code had a sales team, Berlin Sales. Now, as it was, you only sold one class of products. You only sold Muesli. But let's imagine hypothetically your company decided to expand its product line. You might introduce different divisions. And so you might have a dry cereal division and a cooked cereal division. That would just reference different ways of organizing the products that you sell. And then you would have things like finished goods storage and raw material storage where your materials were located. So things that we've been talking about here are things that you have seen in the context of your past experience. Any questions about this? All right, now let's get a little bit more technical. A client. If you were to look up client in the SAP glossary, you would actually see a definition that looks something like this. A client is a self-contained unit in an SAP system with separate master <coughs> records and a complete set of database tables. Now, what in the world is that talking about? And in order to answer that, I want to look at some things in our system together that you have not seen and try to explain this to you. Imagine, and I'll have to put this on the whiteboard, all the information that we're talking about here is stored on a computer, okay? So imagine that this rectangle I'm drawing here on the whiteboard, this is a computer that is really, really, really powerful, okay? And it is powerful enough that it can actually contain information for many different clients. So it might have client 101, 102, and 103 on it. So one of the things that this definition tells us is a client is a self-contained unit in an SAP system with separate master records and a complete set of database tables. So that means that even though client 101, 102, and 103 <coughs> exist on the same computer, they are totally independent of one another. Let's look at that for a moment. I'm going to start with the system that you have been doing your lab work in. I am logged in the same as you would be logged in to client number, well, it scrolls off the side of the screen here, but client number 304. If I run transaction SCC4, which is an administrative transaction, I will discover that this one computer has a whole bunch of clients on it. Client triple zero, 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 one, zero, six, six, and then we start with 300 and we count up sequentially. And in fact, there are 95 clients on this system. Is that normal? Not in a production environment. This is an educational environment. We're not running real companies where we're pumping through a lot of transactions. In a real world environment, you may only have one or a couple of clients on a computer, but as this clearly illustrates, you can have many, many, many clients that are all sharing the same computer. Now what that also means is that every one of these clients 
has to be maintained by the system as functionally independent of one another because they're totally different enterprises. So our enterprise, which we said was, was what again? I've forgotten. 304. 304. It is actually totally independent of 315. There can be no crossover. There can be no undermining of data integrity here. Those systems have to be kept separate. Let me illustrate to you how this actually works, and we're going to get a little bit um, into some database things, but hopefully in a way that would be of understanding to everyone. <coughs> there is a table in the SAP standard database, T001. T001 is a table that contains information about company codes. This right here shows all of the fields that make up that table. You will notice the first field that is listed is client. That's client number. And then company code, company name, city, country, currency, language. And we have a lot of different fields here that are going to populate this table. When I run this, here's what we see. Here is company US02, that's my company, 02 Global Bike Incorporated, based in Dallas of the US. We use the US dollars, our currency. Our base language is English. My general ledger is GL02. And then we can see where other fields have been populated with, with information here. What we could also see if I were interested in this, is we might be able to see if anybody has made an error here because they might be missing data in a particular field or other things of that sort. Because these are things that you have gone about configuring as it relates to your company code. So the point of this is we have one client, which is our client 304, that has 33 company codes defined in it. Now, here's my question to you. Does that mean that this big box here, this big box that represents a computer, does that mean that inside that computer there are in fact only 33 company codes? No. It means that in my client there are 33 company codes. Now you might say, okay, well show me the company codes for a different client. And my answer to you is, can't really do that. Because you'll notice, back on this screen right here, that I have the ability to uh, engage in further specification and turn on and off output and do all kinds of limiting and supplementing of information for every field except for the client field. You notice it says client, but I don't have any controls here at all. And in fact, you might have picked up on the fact that when we looked at the contents of this table, it didn't even show us the client number. It redacted that field from the display. Now as a point of fact, if I click on any one line and hit the details button, I get a pop-up that does tell me that this is client 304. But unless I drill into the details, I don't see that. Because the only information I am being shown is information related to the client I am logged into. So, to go back to what I've drawn here on the whiteboard, if I log in to client 102, that information is treated totally different from client 101 and 103, even though they might be housed on the same computer, and even though they might be sharing the same database tables. That's where this gets interesting. This display purports to show me the contents of table T001. It's not, or it is, but it's only showing me 
the information in table T001 that belongs to me. If we were to look at database tables in SAP ERP, we might see that a given database table would have lots of fields populated with data, but one of the fields, typically the very first field, is named MANDT, which is the German word for client. Mont is usually how I pronounce that. I have no idea if that's the proper German pronunciation or not. But that record, in my case, would have the number 304 here. So when I use the system, it only gives me back information for my client number. And it keeps the other client information totally segregated. Now, I can't illustrate that to you on our configuration system because I have the same level of privilege that you guys do because this is a very widely shared system. But let me show you the same thing in a different system. This system we are going to look at next oh, seems to have dismissed itself <coughs> while we were away. It's that guy right there and he's gone. So I'm going to log into a different system here. At least I'm going to attempt to, which is system AB3. And that guy right there is supposed to be AB3, but if you're like me, you don't see that. So I'm going to close that guy, and let's open up a different AB3. Okay, AB3, and I've got to look up my login information for this system. This is a different system. This is a different machine than the machine we were just looking at. And in fact, I'm going to log in to client number 300. Okay, so um, first thing I'm going to do is we started a moment ago looking at SCC4. You will see that this particular machine <coughs> has multiple clients on it as well, but not, not the same ones. You notice these are numbered in 300, and we've got some 900s, and we have a much smaller set of active clients on this system. <coughs> Let's look at the table T001 that we were looking at a moment ago. On this system. And we will, in fact, see that when I look at table T001, there's only two company codes defined here, DE00 and US00. So now, let's look at something in a different way. And to do this, I'm going to have to run a very, very simple ABAP program. And for those of you that take enterprise programming, you will learn how to do this. This is actually a really, really simple program. And so I'm going to execute this program. Well, let me do this. Let me call up the program. And that is not the program I want. This is the program. This is a program that just goes out and looks at table T001 and pulls out the information. And when I ran a standard database query and said, give me all the company code information, it said, okay, you're on client 300, here's the two different company codes. By the way, that B-U-K-R-S, that's the German term for what we call company code. Uh, and then B-U-T-X-T, is the actual name of your company, okay? Well, so it tells me that in client 300, there are two company codes. But if I go back and change my ABAP program just slightly, <coughs> by telling it that I know what I'm doing and I want you to give me an answer that knocks down the walls between these clients. I want to see the whole shooting match. I can get that. Here's 
client triple zero that has a whole bunch of company codes in it. And if I scroll down, we see all the things that have been defined. Now, some of you might be sitting here thinking, why, why are we looking at this? Why do I care about this? This is a database table that has hundreds of rows in it. That's the way it is stored in the computer. But when I log in to client 980, I only see the information for my organization, even though in the system there's other information. So let's go back. A client is a self-contained unit in an SAP system with separate master records and a complete set of database tables. That's what that database, that's what that definition means. We have our own separate master records. So a material that's created in client 101 doesn't also exist in client 103, even though they're on the same computer system. Questions? Yes? If that's the case, wouldn't that run a security problem then? If somebody could just run a script like that to pull other people's information if you had multiple clients on one machine? It does have that potential. And let me show you an element of configuration that gets to the matter you're talking about. This is the SCC4 transaction we were looking at a moment ago. If I actually dig into the details here and pick a client and look at the information, one of the things that I can specify is can someone make cross-client changes? Could you have an administrator that could administer multiple clients? And if we say yes, then me operating as an administrator has the ability to do that. If we say no, then I lose the ability to see between clients. So it's a matter of administrative configuration. Because sometimes we want to make, let's assume that these three clients are all actually different enterprises that we have some stake in. And we want to go in and make a change and make that change universal to all three clients. Sometimes you need to do that. And so this gives you the ability to do that. This would be something though that an end user or even a power user would not have the ability to do. This would be something that a NetWeaver administrator or a basis administrator would do. <coughs> other questions? All right, let's look at other characteristics of a client. The client is the root of the organizational hierarchy. It is the, the highest organizational element. So if we were going to build an org chart this is the very top note on the org chart under which everything else flows from. If two companies are related, they must be contained in the same client. So if Kraft ran a conglomerate running SAP ERP, the companies that they all operate would be housed in the same client. But they would have their own independent company codes, as we'll see here in a few moments. Now, as I mentioned before, generally, you're only going to see one client per SAP production instance. But that's generally true and not always the case. Clearly, in our situation here, where we're an educational institution, we have multiple clients on the same machine. Can anybody think of another instance where a real world company might want to have one machine that has multiple clients on it? Government. Government meaning what? Uh, I mean like specific government agencies won't have multiple clients on a machine. Okay. 
I think probably we'd still run into a problem there because I'm going to guess most multiple most government agencies are pretty big, yeah. and so they're probably going to need their own system. Okay. So the key is we're talking about a small client, and the a good answer to my question, but probably not the only one, is sometimes companies will have training systems, and they'll set up a computer. And they'll actually have multiple instances of different training systems that they use for training their employees and maybe even training developers and things like that. They're not actually used for production. They're not actually used for real world work, but they mimic the real world system, but they're a dummy system. And we don't care about them. We want users to explore the system. We want to give them the ability to mess things up without it causing problems. So we might set up a system that has many, many different clients on it that we only use for training purposes. And, and that's pretty common. And that's consistent with the statement here that generally there's only one client per SAP production instance. We might have training and other systems that that uh, operate differently than that rule of thumb. Very, very important fact. Master data is created at the client level. Master data is created at the client level. So I'm going to back up in my slides, a couple slides, and, and let's talk about this hypothetical example in regards to craft. One example of master data is a vendor. Let's assume that there is a company out there called um, Wally's Wheat. And Wally's Wheat sells flour. And if you look at the different companies here, flour is probably used in Chips Ahoy and Oreos and, and maybe some of the other products here. Clearly it would be used in like uh, crackers and things like that. So we want to set Wally's Wheat up as a vendor. So we set Wally's Wheat up and we, we give it a vendor number and the vendor number for Wally's Wheat is 00137246. And let's assume that it was an employee at Shake and Bake that set up Wally's Wheat in the system. Once Wally's Wheat is in the system, every one of the company codes can see that company. Which means that somebody that works for Triscuit can see Wally's Wheat in the system. Now, that means that they can see certain information about that company. They can see the name of the company. They can see the uh, customer number. They can see the address of the company. But what they can't see is how much Shake and Bake owes that company. Because financial records are kept differently, as we will continue to explore as, as we go along here. But master data when it is created is created at the client level as we observed a moment ago in answer to a question some configuration and some data elements can span across multiple clients within the same database but those are extremely rare extremely rare to the point that i don't know if i could name you one that you will interact with all semester. So when we create master data, when we create products, when we create company codes, when we create customers, when we create vendors, all of those things are created at the client level. Questions? Company code. Company code, a distinct legal entity contained within an ERP system. The most important phrase in that entire definition is distinct legal entity. How do I know what is a company code? The answer to that is whatever the government tells me is a company code. Because if you have to pay taxes, you have to keep your own financial records. 
If you have to keep your own financial records, congratulations, you're a company code. So a company code is a distinct legal entity contained within an ERP system where we mean when we say distinct legal entity, it has to keep its own financial accounting records and it reports its operations independently. So even though, for example, um, according to the diagram, Kraft <coughs> owns Yum and Yum owns Taco Bell and Pizza Hut, Taco Bell and Pizza Hut both file taxes independently of one another. They're part of the same conglomerate, but legally speaking, they are separate taxable entities. Therefore, they are company codes. If you remember this principle, it will probably get you at least five or 10 questions right on the midterm exam. Financial accounting revolves around the company code. And we will see how that manifests itself as we go along this semester. All of financial accounting is focused on the company code. Why is financial accounting focused on the company code? Because that's who does the financial statements. According to who? IRS, SEC. The government. Okay, whatever we are told by our outside reporting entity, which in the United States would be the IRS or the SEC, in Germany would be the German equivalent of that, whatever, you know, this is a global system here. So as we go from country to country to country, inside of that country, whatever the government says to those organizations in terms of how they file taxes, if they have to file taxes and have to report their taxes independently, they are a company code. We manage accounts at the company code level. Business transactions are carried out at the company code level. Why? Because the company code is the focal element of financial accounting. Financial accounting is responsible for recording the implications of all of our business transactions from a financial perspective. Therefore, since financial accounting focuses on the company code, all of our transactions happen at the company code level. All of our accounts are managed at the company code level. Company codes cannot span country borders. Why can company codes not span country borders? Tax laws. Tax laws. Different laws, different countries, different company codes. So company codes do not span country borders. If, so what I'm saying is we might think of ourselves as one company, but if our company has German operations and American <coughs> operations and Mexican operations, it's three different company codes because we have to keep those financial regulate we have to keep those financial records segregated why because we don't pay money to the mexican government in taxes from american transactions and we don't pay the american government taxes based on what happened in germany <coughs> so we have to keep all of our country operations separate in our financial accounting so company codes do not span country borders. A client, as we have observed, may contain one or more company codes. And in fact, in order for, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself here, a company code can only exist in one client. So we never have a company code that spans across multiple clients. A client may contain one or more company codes a company code can be in only one client. And then the last observation here, for a client to be considered live and usable, it has to have at least one active company code. Why? Taxes. Taxes is not a bad answer, but it's not the best answer. Why do we have to have a company code to have a live system? Because you're not making any money if you don't have a 
Okay, and where do we capture money? Financial statements. Fin well, financial statements, which are a part of? The transaction system. Transaction systems, which are underneath the umbrella of? Financial accounting. Financial accounting, okay? You can't do transactions without financial accounting. Financial accounting revolves around the company code. Therefore, in order to actually run transactions on a system, we have to have a company code set up. Because without a company code, we have no ability to engage in financial accounting. We'll come back to that principle and expand it a lot as the semester goes along. But you will be well served by remembering that the key role that a company code fulfills in an enterprise information system is it is the focal element of financial accounting. Which means that, to be very precise about this, well actually I don't have to change out my PowerPoint slides, it's a PowerPoint slide I'm looking for, which means that these independent company codes that exist in the same client all have their own general ledger, they all have their own ability to generate profit and loss statements. They all have their own distinct balance sheets. They are separate entities. Now, could I, for the sake of wanting to see how my overall organization is doing, could I aggregate them? Absolutely. But I can't just have one aggregated financial statement for everything on this screen. Every one of these companies has to have their own distinct financial accounting records, and then if I want to aggregate them, uh, I, I certainly am free to do so. Questions about this? Yes, sir. What, uh, what does it take to get a company code from IRS or whatever institution that issues one? I'm pretty sure that if you start doing business, the IRS will find you. Um, but, you know, that's why you either have accountants that work for you or you hire a bookkeeper, um, you know, to get into that, some states require you to be licensed by the state or other things like that. But, you know, you may have to buy a license or, or something of that sort, but it's not hard to start operating your business. You could operate a sole proprietorship out of your home. Um, and, and the key is you're going to have to start paying taxes on it. And so from a perspective here, um, you would be a company code at that point. Keep in mind, although we're talking about taxes, you do have organizations that don't pay taxes because they're tax exempt. But even many of those organizations still, even though they're tax exempt, they still have to file tax returns with the government. It's just that they don't have to pay any money. The government likes to know what people are up to. And so you still have financial accounting, even though you may not be for profit. Organizational elements focused on sales. We'll just talk about these at a really high level and then dig into the nitty gritty when we talk about the fulfillment process in detail. A sales organization is the term we use to describe the central organizational element that controls terms of sale to the customer. So for example, we might have a team of salespeople that work in the Tri-Cities area. And there are Tri-City sales teams. And we have a Nashville sales team. And we have a Memphis sales team. And we have an Atlanta sales team. Those would perhaps be distinct sales organizations in my company. Why would I want to break my company up into distinct sales organizations? analyze the data? To be able to collect data so that I can compare performance from one sales organization to another. I can see how the Pensacola people are doing versus the Dallas people and I can track metrics across different sales organizations. Notice as well it gives me the ability to say that different sales organizations can offer different terms of sales to customers. It may well be that in the Tri-Cities area we have decided as an organization that the terms of sale that we are going to use are going to be 210 net 30. If you pay within 10 days, you get a 2% discount. Otherwise, you've got to pay us in 30 days. And that might be the terms of sale that the Tri-City Sales Organization is authorized to offer. Another sales organization might have three or four different terms of sale that they are authorized to offer. 
So we can control the terms of sale that we offer to customers based on what we authorize sales organizations to be able to engage in. Distribution channel. <coughs> A distribution channel is the mechanism through which goods and or services reach the customer. Now, when we think about this, we typically think of this um, logically as opposed to physically. So we're not really thinking of this in terms of trucks versus airplanes versus fuel pipelines and things like that. We're thinking of this in terms of sales that come to us over the internet versus sales that come to us from customers that got our catalog in the mail versus sales that come to us from, you don't see this anymore, door-to-door -door salespeople versus people that walked into our retail store and made a purchase. So the idea is if we think about all the different ways we sell, and everything here is focused on selling, if you think about the different ways that we sell, those are distinct distribution channels. A division is a logical grouping of related products. So your companies that you are in the process of setting up have different divisions. You have the bicycle division and you have the accessories division. If we were the Ford Motor Company, we might have the light truck division, the heavy truck division, the passenger car division, and the parts division and other parts of our organization. It's just a way that we choose to break things up into groups for the sake of organization. Now, it's very important to realize that all of this are things that are given to us to enable us to put together groups for the sake of tracking. So a company could say, we have one sales organization, salespeople, and that's all of our salespeople over the whole globe, they're all in one sales organization. Okay, fine, you can do that. Or you could have 87 sales organizations. Distribution channel, we might just have stores. So we only have one distribution channel, retail stores. Other organizations say, no, we sell online, we have retail operations, we also sell wholesale, we also sell these other ways. So we're gonna define seven different distribution channels. It gives us a way to group things up logically to manage our operation. In ERP SIM, every company had one sales organization that was totally transparent to you. But you all had your own distinct distribution channel. Remember distribution channel 10, 12, and 14, one of which was grocery stores, one of which was hypermarkets, and one of which was convenience stores. Those are different distribution channels as defined by the company as far as the way that they wanted to think in, about the mechanisms they use to distribute their goods and services. Divisions is more tending to focus on how we organize ourselves internally. The light truck team for Ford Motor Company probably has its own marketing people, probably has its own sales people, probably has its own product designers, and they probably function much like a company within a company because they're just focused on light trucks whereas the heavy truck division is focusing on a whole different kind of product, different salespeople, maybe different distribution channels, so we put them in different divisions. Now, every sales order that we make <coughs> as a company is tagged with a sales area. A sales area is a unique combination of a sales organization distribution channel and division. So what I'm telling you is every time we make a sale, that sale is assigned to a sales organization, it's assigned to a distribution channel, it's assigned to a division. And because we're always going to make that set of assignments, we define that as a sales area. And in fact, there are valid and invalid sales areas. Let me give you a real world example of this. If we go back to the very early days of e-commerce, a lot of organizations had trouble when they started selling online. A great example of that 
was a company that you don't hear much about anymore. I'm not even totally sure if they're still in business, but uh, Radio Shack, okay? Radio Shack operated stores. They still operate stores if they're still around. And you could go into Radio Shack and you could buy electronics and batteries and all kinds of electronics kind of junk. And so Radio Shack had stores all over the United States. One of the best things that happened to Radio Shack was when they started um, selling computers. And Radio Shack had a computer called the TRS-80 that was one of the first computers that people could buy and afford to bring into their home. By modern standards, um, wow, I don't even know how you'd compare it. I mean, even back then, people used to refer to it as the Trash 80 because it wasn't exactly a, a really great computer system, but you could buy it and have it in your home. And so the Radio Shack stores were thrilled because people actually would started coming into their stores. And they would you know, play around with the TRS-80 and they would sell the TRS-80 and, and life was good. Okay, so back then, if we were the Radio Shack company, we had one distribution channel. And that one distribution channel was uh, retail stores. Well, Radio Shack decides to start selling online. So, they open up a whole new distribution channel that we'll call internet. <coughs> and in fact, they started selling online before there was the internet. They were selling on CompuServe and AOL, um, which actually predated the availability of the internet. But we'll just, for now, we'll just call that internet. So Radio Shack says, guess what? You can buy using your I don't, you know, it's kind of circular. I don't know how you buy a computer online unless you have a computer. But nonetheless, uh, you go to a friend's house, you can log in, use their computer, and you can buy a TRS-80 over the internet and have it shipped to your home. And the motive for this is it's going to be a little bit cheaper than buying it in a retail store. Radio Shack, the company, was thrilled with this because they could sell a lot more TRS-80s and drive their revenue and profit up. Who was not happy about this? Sales stores. Salespeople's a good answer. Or the retail <laughs> stores weren't happy about this. Because before, if you lived in the Tri-Cities area and wanted a TRS-80, you had to drive to a Radio Shack store and buy it. Now you could live in the Tri-Cities and buy a TRS-80 and never set foot in a store. So in the early days of e-commerce, a lot of retailers got really, really mad at their suppliers or their main company because they were now cut out of the revenue chain. So what started to happen is companies started doing all these interesting things where they would say like, if maybe the commission for selling a TRS-80 if the store would have made, let's say, about $100 in it, Radio Shack would say, okay, here's what we're going to do. Um, any sale that we get online from your geographic region, even though you had nothing to do with that sale, we'll give you $30 to offset this differential here. And they started doing things like that to try and make retailers a little bit happier. Now, as time has gone by and the internet is well defined, this has become more of a standard business arrangement that different companies handle in different ways. But in the early days of the internet, keeping track of where sales originated from <coughs> one address and other things of that sort became a key part in revenue sharing and paying of commissions and other things along those lines. So that's an example of how tracking things by distribution channel could be very important to an organization. Beyond that, you have companies like Land's End that still mails out a lot of catalogs and a lot of people still order from those catalogs. Land's End might want to know, how are our catalog sales doing? Well, the only way they're going to know is if at the time they capture a sale, 
they record that that sale came through the catalog distribution channel. So that's why we have to track all of this. Additionally, this idea of the sales area says that there are some combinations that might be valid and invalid. So for example here, the Berlin sales team is authorized to sell dry cereal and they can sell it wholesale. The Berlin sales team can also sell cooked cereal and they can sell it wholesale. But if we were to look at all of the <coughs> viable sales areas that we have defined in our organization, we might see that Berlin sales does not have a sales area that says that they can sell dry cereal on the internet. So they're precluded from doing that. They're not authorized to sell in that fashion. We might have some sales teams that are authorized to sell a wide variety of different kinds of products, but they can only sell retail and not wholesale at all. So this gives us a way to control this within our organization. So the definition of a sales area does two things for us. It ensures that every sale that we make is tagged with the sales organization that made the sale, the distribution channel that the sale was a result of, and the division representing the category of products. That not only allows us to track it, but allows us to authorize, or by inference not authorize, these sales areas. And I'm not sure, you guys set up financial accounting, and I think right now in your lab work you're setting up procurement. So you probably have not set this up yet, but I'm going to guess in the next couple of weeks you'll go in and you'll define all of this that we're talking about here. So that will give you a good way to uh, practice what it is that we're talking about. Questions? Plant. A plant is a location where goods or services are produced, maintained, or distributed. That is the technical definition of a plant in SAP ERP. So notice that definition says that if I have a location where services are distributed, or if you will, services are rendered, that's a plant. So a doctor's office could be a plant. A facility where people bring their stuff, drop it off, come back a few days later and we fixed it for them, that's a plant. Any place in our organization where we produce goods and services or we maintain goods and services, we might think of that as uh, when we're talking about maintaining and distributing a distribution center. So we might make them at a plant and ship them to another facility that is a plant for the sake of storing it and shipping it out to customers. So the universal term here that we use for locations where goods and services are produced, maintained, or distributed are plant. Plants are very important to us. Plants are the central organizational element in logistics. So company codes are the focal element of financial accounting. Logistics meaning the shipping of materials, the receiving of materials, all of our movements related to materials are going to be focused on plants because that is the central organization in logistics. Every plant has to belong to a company code and every plant can belong to only one company code. Why? Efficiency, if a purchaser <coughs> comes in and it triggers one company code to start production, it would be tough if another one had the same plant and it came in at the same time, so then you wouldn't have the resources to produce the same amount. Okay, that makes perfect sense. I can't deny anything you just said, but that's not really a great answer to this question. But thanks for playing. Yes, sir? Accounting and depreciation. What's that? Accounting and depreciation. Okay, well, now depreciation is not a, you know, can you be more specific in what you just said? 
What was it? What you said? Accounting and depreciation. Is that what you said? Ownership of the plant. What's that? Someone has to own the plant. Someone has to own the plant. Okay, I, I like that idea, but I'm still not hearing the the two magic words that are the best answer to this question. Financial accounting. Financial accounting. When I say company code in your brain, you need to automatically attach that to financial accounting. Every plant belongs to only one company code. Why? Because this plant is going to generate activity which we have to capture in financial accounting. How do we capture financial accounting data? We capture it in a company code. If I have an expense in a plant, that expense needs to trace back to a financial accounting transaction. It can only go against one company code. Therefore, every plant belongs to only one company code so that all of the activities of this plant are going to be captured from a financial accounting perspective in the company code to which it's assigned. Now, a company code can have as many plants as they want. But every plant belongs to just one company code. As an aside, and we may talk more about this in the future, realize that we can do some things that might be different than you are thinking right now. This building right here represents the very sophisticated Google Earth view of a plant. Okay? You know, here's the smokestack and so on. When you and I look at this, we work for this company, we might call this the Akron plant. And we think of it as <coughs> one plant. But guess what? In our organization, if in fact you walked into this building, you might see that there's different stuff going on on this side of the building versus different stuff going on on this side of the building. Although this is one physical building, this might be plant P1 and plant P2. And what happens over here connects up to company code 1. And what happens over here connects up to company code 2. But we have to keep these operations totally segregated. And we can do that. So get away from the fact of thinking that a plant is a physical building. A plant is where goods and services are produced, maintained, or distributed, and therefore one physical building could actually hold multiple distinct plants. But the key element here is plant belongs to company code, company code, financial accounting. Storage location. A storage location is a place within a plant where goods are stored. Every plant has to have at least one storage location. And every storage location can only belong to one plant. Okay? So I'm going to stick with my example I'm putting here on the whiteboard. Inside of plant one, we have a storage room where we put all of our trading goods. And we just call that storage room TG1. Okay? And we have another room, or it might not be a room, it might just be a region of the facility where we put our finished goods. And we call that room finished goods. So every plant has to have at least one storage location. I mean, it could be anything as small as a supplies closet where we keep the printer paper to something that is mammothly huge. Each storage location belongs to just one plant. I include the next point because SAP on their tests loves to ask this question. If you think your teachers like to ask trick questions, um, SAP is masterful at these. They they will, they will melt your brain on their tests. A storage location <laughs> code may be the same in multiple plants. 
Here's what SAP likes to do. They like to trick you. They like for you to remember the principle that every plant must have at least one storage location and every storage location belongs to only one plant. And they will ask you a question like, true or false, storage location TG1 <coughs> can only be present in one plant. And you say, ooh, storage locations can only belong to one plant, I will say true. Storage location TG1 can only belong to, to plant one. And you just got that question wrong, okay? Let me give you an analogy. This is Nick's Hall. This is Lamb Hall. In Nick's Hall, we might have room 101. In Lamb Hall, we might have room 101. Are those different rooms? Do they have the same identifying code? Yes, but they are clearly different rooms, right? I mean, they're even in different buildings. So if you look back at our rules here, Every plant has to have at least one storage location. A storage location belongs to only one plant, <laughs> but a storage location code could be repeated in different plants, but they're references to different storage locations. So my P1 plant might have a room called trading goods, and my P2 plant might have a room called trading goods. They have the same name, but they're clearly different rooms in different plants. Okay? So don't let that <coughs> trip you up in understanding the, the concepts here. Questions about this? Storage locations become very, very critical in warehouse management. And in warehouse management, which we will get to at the very end of the semester, we start seeing really, really weird terms like quants and bins and slots and other things of that sort, which are ways of subdividing different storage locations. As we wrap up for today, let me just show you a couple examples. This is actually related to the lab work we're doing. The lab work we are doing, all of you and me are working in GBI Enterprise, which is our client. <coughs> when we started the semester in that client, there were two reference company codes there. US00, which was a generic US company, and DE00, which was a generic German company. And those companies had their own Dallas plant, San Diego plant, Miami plant, Heidelberg plant, and Hamburg plant, as you see here. What you did in phase one is you created your own company code. You have now begun the process of creating your own plans. And you have been attaching those together. Now, if you think about what you had to do, in phase one, you set up your company code. And most of phase one was focused on setting up the basics of your financial accounting. You set up your general ledger, you set up your chart of accounts, and a lot of other things that we'll dig into in more detail. You had to do that first before you could do anything else, because everything in an ERP system revolves around financial accounting, and financial accounting revolves around the company code. All right, well, we're out of time for today, so this is where we will stop. Have a great rest of the day, everyone, and I'll look forward to seeing you next week.